Nicole Johnson. Come on down. And Carla Weaver. <coughs> Scott <coughs> Wojciechowski. Daryl Baker, Tina Arn, and Carl Hoffman. Uh, Anthony Gray, you know, Chiado cannot be with us. <coughs> Playground 
where the kids could actually play, but people died <laughs> and it became a cemetery. And on the other end of the cemetery is uh, Papa Bear's home. It's sort of like a trailer park sort of home. So it's sort of them meeting in the middle, sort of on this. Um, I know a couple places in Boston like that. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious about the names. The names. Um, well, the names uh, are two. There are two kind of reasons for that. The names. Um, the first part is, it's sort of for myself to sort of get this. I I really I really just like plays that have pretty explicit exposition, and sort of like like oh, Carol, and so you know her name is Carol. But um, I think their friendship is so. <laughs> I think their friendship is so, um, it's deep, and it's been so long-lasting that they never really address each other by their real names. Um, but also in that, um, the names are sort of significant of sort of how they've moved on in a way. Nine o'clock, um, we hear about this guy who just called her nine o'clock, and that has an actual real reason behind it. She doesn't understand it, but there is an actual deeper reasoning that's not in this. And the Papa Bear thing is sort of, him moving on and sort of learning to parent himself after he loses his mother and sort of on the verge of almost becoming a parent himself, which would be a catastrophe for a miracle or something. But but yeah, I think that's why they that's why I chose those names. Any other comments, questions? So you said you write it not sequential. Right. Do you have an overall I mean, do you know where it's going? Yeah, I know where it's going. It's I know I know the ending better than anything, and it's it's well, this backwards. seems not backwards necessarily. I just get points that I know that I want, and then I find bridges, and I feel that that helps sort of because it is a play that goes back and forth. So I think it helps just to keep those those strings attached. So what is the main conflict then? Main conflict of the, the whole story itself. Yes. Um, I would say it's about moving on and sort of this friendship that is disintegrating and um, some sort of like salvage. They're trying to salvage it in this way, but um, like I said, in this past moment where he has his arm and he tries to engage her and it doesn't work, and he strikes her. Um, it could have just ended there, but it didn't. And I think that Nine O'Clock is a character who really believes in, in forgiveness in a way, and I think that's why she comes back and has this real genuine moment with him. Um, there's not a lot about Nine O'Clock's arc in this bit, but um, in the full version, there's, there's definitely a deeper arc. It's probably more significant than this one, but. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hey, wait, you're way back there. Uh, I found it very current, annoying the way that he had the cell phone always at his ready because it's pretty well in the face world, so I thought that was good. Thank you. I like to annoy people. <laughs> <laughs>
of David Green Boy is 1819. Did we see the beginning of the play? Where does this fall into the play? This is actually the start of it. Yeah, I, I think you begin several large and important themes in a very funny way. I'm mean, kind of curious as to where it goes. Um, so essentially the characters um, within the play, it should flash on scenes within their life that parallel, even though they're from opposite ends of the spectrum. She's religious, he's gay. Um, it's showing how similar, even though they're from very different backgrounds, how similar uh, their problems are and how that brings them together to relate. So it's it'll flow in that direction. Is she religious or does she use her religion or her her talk her her relationship with God basically to bring about things that she wants to do? I think she depends upon God because she doesn't feel that acceptance within her own life. So there's a dependency there. And so her friends are kind of, her friends are kind of pushing um, the fact that it's like, we don't think he's real. But then again, they're not really real either. So she's trying to figure things out, but there's still that huge reliance on, on God. So I don't think she's using God, but I think there's a huge unhealthy dependence.
what it is is monsters have kind of, or demons, however you want to put it, have reached the kind of point in humanity where they're just starting to kind of get acceptance, but there's still a lot of people out there that just hate and revile them. Like, there's a character we didn't meet yet uh, called Alexander Fontaine, whose entire life, he's lived, you know, like a thousand years. He's kind of a Van Helsing type. And his entire life is, he, he just hunts down and, and kills werewolves. Oh. And so, <laughs> he comes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think where this is going. Okay. <laughs> Good. That means I can shut up. <laughs> it certainly seems like this was a real crowd pleaser. Absolutely. So, so do you do you have an image of who your audience is? From well, I, sh I should say something here. Um, I've been writing for years, but this is actually the first time I've ever let anyone see my work. My, my, no. I, show my, I show my work to my brother and sometimes my mom, but this is the first time.
they destroy each other's lives. They ruin each other's lives to the point where they just go, we can't do this anymore. So they go to this witch and she separates them. So it, it couldn't be played by one actor. It has to be played by two. Originally when I was uh, coming up with the concept, it was going to be one, but then I thought, no, that would be more interesting to go two. Thank you so much. What last well, the physical description, I mean, because I read it, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. is yeah, yeah, very different between those, you know, the two halves of. Oh yes, Jackson is a fat, normal yeah. guy, and uh, uh, Alan is a thin werewolf. <laughs> I, I just wonder what in your mind made you think that could happen. Yeah. I, I'm just curious. You know how physically. Well, see, the thing that's got to be understood is Alan is his own being. It isn't like, you know, he, <laughs> he, he's his own entity. And so he, when Jackson, you know, it, it transforms into him, it's a whole new person. It's this whole other being of existence that's hiding inside of him, if that makes any sense at all. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, going from fat to thin, I mean, I wish I knew how to do that trick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, so the right side of when you watch the werewolf, the, you know, whatever the name is, Blonder changing into the werewolf, it's like, yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah. Moving on, thank you so much. Uh, Daryl, Tina, and Carl. Uh, this is Crazy Old Man. Another take on Noah. <laughs> Comments, please. Yes. I have wanted to ask this for two and a half years. Why Noah? Why Noah? Why Noah? Why did you pick Noah? I was working as musical director at an amusement park that kept the movie animals. And we had these animals available. And they wanted to do a big show, and they hired me to write a story about Noah, Noah's Ark. We had, it was 175 feet by 75 feet. We had elephants and lions and tigers, everything you can imagine building the ark on stage. Well, it was only a half hour long. And uh, I thought, this, this, there's more to Noah than, than a half hour thing, you know, and so. Yeah, there was no book to it. No, there was no book. Was 12 songs. songs and some narration. So I threw about five or six songs out, wrote nine new ones, and three of us wrote the script. Over the period of uh, well, over hours. <laughs> <laughs> over years, decades. Decades, you know. We all had, had all of our hair. And <laughs> <laughs> now, now, I've read this script, and this was one of the more serious scenes. Uh, I haven't read but the final script, but I read it quite some time ago. There's, there's more to that story that's on the billion side. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I mean, I don't want to get, you guys know the Bible story. Noah's Ark business took place in Samaria, 800 miles away from the Holy Land. And uh, um, now what was I going to say? <laughs> uh, ah, yes. Um, we wanted to make the story palatable for everybody. I didn't want to be too religious. I didn't want to be not religious. I wanted to find a nice middle ground. And what we ended up doing was create an evil character who came in, a Dr. Penny and his carnival extraordinaire, come into town and bring sin and corruption and loose women and all this stuff. So this little town in the middle of nowhere, which is actually Mayberry. <laughs> Noah is Noah is for all practical purposes Andy Andy Taylor. He's a normal guy. He's been sheriff forever. Noah's been mayor for 20 terms. I mean, they lived a long time in those days. Nobody else wants the job. He's a normal guy. He's a cheese man. The most exciting thing about the development of the show to me was what happened with Ruth and Noah. Um, because they have this solid thing. All they, they, they help each other out. And that's the most important thing to me in the show. You guys may have different ideas what's important. But well, yeah, I think where Josh was the, the thing about the vaudeville, the thing that we did with the evil, Noah and his family are rooted in a time and a place and a reality that was a long time ago. Dr. Payne and his carnival are timeless, as is evil conveniently. 
So they can show up with a roulette wheel that's got 13 purple on it and have shekels, even though shekels didn't come along for many, many moons after the time of Noah. And so there's, there's this, these two different levels throughout, and, and the comic level is definitely Dr. Payne and Erwin and his carnival. Yeah, we felt like, you know, we're going to kill everybody off at the end of this thing. We should make it as funny as we can. <laughs> <laughs> Much like most of the scripts we saw. <laughs> So, so Dr. Payne is really a vaudevillian sort of guy. They have a tap dance number they do together and all. A lot of different kinds of music in this. Well, having connections and having listened to the whole score, the only thing, I, one thing that came to my mind was... Noah? Yes. <laughs> Build an ark. What's an ark? George Crosby, I mean, and all the music fit to that type of hilarity that he brought to Noah Building New York. Um, it's uh, like, it, it's got to be, it's got to be that way. You know, we don't, oh, yeah. at the end of the show, there's a big, huge number that brings all the drowned people back. You know, we, we don't want to talk about that. We don't like, we don't want to think about it. So it's a little touchy, but yes, sir. I just want to say comment. So what I loved about it was, you know, we know the story, right? And we're listening, I'm listening to the dialogue, and what I liked about it was I'm hearing the dialogue, and I'm hearing a story I kind of know, and then when she broke it a song, the song was so beautiful. It, it, I felt like everything made sense. Like, every, all the dialogue, I kind of knew about the story. It's like, the first song just personified. Oh, yes. <laughs> 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 and yeah, yeah. Yeah.
thank you all. And what I'd like to open up conversation for any of the playwrights you'd like to speak to or ask questions of, because we were moving along kind of rapidly. If there's someone you haven't had a chance to ask a question of or make a comment to, this would be a really good time to do that. Um, and, and playwrights, anything you'd like to say to the audience? I did want to thank the actors tonight. I, I think they did a phenomenal job. All the way through. <laughs> Thank you, playwrights. Thank you, audience. Thank you, exquisite actors. Well, well,